Hello, it's the ghost. Welcome to They Call Me the Ghost. On this channel, I want us to be able to understand the difference between just throwing something out there on the internet and what we really find to be true. Okay, so let me tell you what this all is. And I'm getting this from the Criminal Journal. And this was posted a couple of years ago. But when you're talking 70 years, a couple of years doesn't matter when you're dealing with someone's entire life. Okay, so let's take a look at this. George Stinney Jr., he was 14 years old and the youngest person to be put to death by the electric chair for a murder conviction that was overturned 70 years later. So all of us need to think back to 14 and then 70 years later. This is a long time. George Junius Stinney Jr. was a 14-year-old boy who was put to death by the electric chair for the murder of two girls, Betty June Binnaker, who was only 11, and get this, Mary Emma Thames, who was only 8. And this happened in South Carolina, making him the youngest person to be executed in the United States at that time. Makes you wonder how all of that would go over in today's world. All right, well, seven decades after his execution, his murder conviction was overturned. Can you believe that? On March 24, 1944, Betty and her friend Mary left their homes on their bicycles and rode through the small town searching for wildflowers. The girls stopped by George's home as he was grazing the family cow and asked him where they could find flowers. Later that night, a search party was organized after Betty and Mary were reported missing when they failed to return home. This is every parent's nightmare. And how many kids go out there every single day to go explore, find things, find their friends, and they're gone for a while? Well, in this case, they were missing. The following morning, Betty Binnaker and Mary Thames were found deceased. Their bodies were discovered partially submerged in a cruddy drainage ditch with their bikes on top of them. This is very degrading. I'm not really sure what could be worse for these two girls. An autopsy revealed that Betty and Mary had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer-like object, leaving their skulls severely smashed. The medical examiner noted that there were no bruises on the girls, not on their bodies, anywhere. There weren't any signs of sexual assault. And then George becomes the primary suspect in the case after a witness told investigators that George made mention of him being the last person to see the girls alive. When George was arrested on suspicion of murder, the lumber mill where his father worked had forced his family to move out of company housing. And back then, a lot of companies provided housing, so this would be devastating. His family left town to avoid being lynched leaving George to deal with his charges, trial, and execution alone. That's just a tragedy in itself. The next time they saw him, he was lying dead in a coffin, and his face was severely burned. During the police interrogation, it was alleged that George confessed to murdering Betty and Mary, and he even gave graphic details of how he executed this. He told investigators that he was smitten with Betty, and he wanted to be with her but he somehow needed to get rid of her friend. When he decided to kill her, the girls fought back. During the scuffle, he beat them to death with a 15-inch railroad spike. Okay, but there's no proof that George Stinney Jr. admitted to these killings. No real proof of this, as investigators at that time never provided a written statement or any audio of his confession. On April 24, 1944, George Stinney Jr.'s trial began at the Clarendon County Courthouse, where more than a thousand people were in attendance. That's a lot for back then, including his then 30-year-old court-appointed attorney, Charles Plowden, who did very little to defend his client. Plowden failed to cross-examine any witnesses, and his only defense was that George was too young to be held accountable for the murders of Betty Binnaker and Mary Thames. Although there was no evidence linking George to these crimes, the jury only deliberated for 10 minutes before returning a guilty verdict. Just three hours after the trial commenced, this all is happening. That's very quick. 
Plowden told the court that they would not appeal the conviction as George's family didn't have the means to do so. That same day, George Stinney Jr. was sentenced to death by electric chair. I mean, this is really spinning his life around quite quickly. And then on June 16th in 1944, George walked into the execution chamber. He had a Bible in his hand, and the officers led him over to the adult-sized electric chair. So we have this boy. He weighs 95 pounds at the time. And this even made it difficult for the officers to strap him down in the chair. He was just too small. But when he was finally secured, they placed that large mask over his face. And after flipping the switch, 2,400 volts of electricity passed through George's body. His mask fell off, and when his face was exposed, witnesses could see that wide-eyed teen. He had tears rolling down his cheeks and saliva foaming around the corners of his mouth. You can picture this. The Post and Courier newspaper reported that the switch was flipped again, sending another shot of 1,400 volts. And then, get this, they do it again, sending another 500 volts. And when you're putting someone into the electric chair, you do want to make sure there's nothing in between, right? You are there and then you just need to move on. You want to make sure the job gets done. Three minutes and 45 seconds later, George Junius Stinney Jr. was dead. His time of death was 7.30 p.m. George was then buried at the Calvary Baptist Church Cemetery in Clarendon, South Carolina. Okay, so moving on. This is done. There's nothing else to do, right? Well, relatives of George stated that George was innocent of these crimes and their attorney demanded a new trial, as they believed his confession had been coerced. We think we have the opportunity here to make a difference and correct a wrong that's been here for 70 years, said the defense attorney. South Carolina still recognizes George Stinney as a murderer. We felt that something needed to be done about that. The fact of the matter is, he says, it happened and occurred because of a legal system of justice that was in place and that we, for all know, based on the record, worked properly. Well, on December 17th in 2014, this is 70 years after George was put to death by the electric chair, a circuit judge overturned his murder conviction. In a 29-page order, the judge wrote, Given the particularized circumstances of George's case, I find by a preponderance of evidence standard that a violation of the defendant's procedural due process rights tainted his prosecution. It is due process that protects us after all, isn't it? Defense attorney Stephen McKenzie said, By not putting the state's case to the test at all, by not cross-examining witnesses, not putting up a defense at all, giving a closing argument. George was never afforded effective counsel, and as a result, his Sixth Amendment rights were violated. Attorneys in the case stated that it has been decades since these killings occurred, and because of that, the person responsible for these murders may never be brought to justice. What do we think of that? How tragic. And, you know, with all the stuff that's going on right now, we should take notice of our personal rights and the justice system. They are what protect us, after all, here in the United States anyway. So let me know your thoughts of this. It's tragic. I don't believe that this would have gone this way this quickly if it were in the world today. But what do you think? And how do we resolve this in our minds? Just another person put to death accidentally? It's not something we should be okay with. This family certainly wasn't, and they did something about it. What would you do? How would you take in this truth? How would you handle it? Let me know what you think, and I will talk to you all soon.